morning to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. I want to read from verse 13. And we'll read down through verse 20, 19 or 20. And there'll be some other places that we'll go to today. But I want to talk about the church. The church. And I want us to look at basically three things in the message. I want to look at the promise of the church, or the prophecy it could be called. I want to look at the power of the church. Where does the power to operate come from? And then the program for the church, or what is our purpose and mission? How are we to carry that out? So let's read from verse 13, Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ, following Jesus' name as we have come to this point in our service that we're to look in the scriptures and allow you to teach us today. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for Brenda's words and how she has a heart for you and, and for these uh, Native Americans and the people there. Lord, I pray you continue to help her to develop that and, and be involved wherever you would have her in, the, in your work. And then Lord I pray for all of us today that we would catch a vision like Isaiah had when he saw the Lord and saw himself and got cleansed and then he said here am I send me. Yes. And Lord even as our church is not great in number but you will show us we don't have to be a great big church to allow you to do mighty things through us. Because you use the small and you use the weak and you use the despised and you use the nothings to reveal your great power. Now, Father, I pray as we look at your word that you will help us today draw from it. Lord, show us your plan. Now, Lord, I pray as always that you hide me behind the cross and help me to decrease as you increase in the message. Help me not any way to block the view of the cross today, but may I magnify you and may we see Jesus in his name. Amen. 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 Now, let's look for a few minutes this morning at the church. The church and see just what the church is and how we are to operate. First thing we need to understand is that the word church, the ecclesia, means called out one. So the actual word itself means that this is a group of people that have been called out of the world, of the surroundings and set up as a another uh, another uh, thing to function or really the church is an organism in the world not an organization so we've been called out and set up to function as a church in this world the purpose of bringing honor 
and glory to God. Now when we look at these verses here, I want to kind of exegete these verses first before we go on into some other things in the message. Because now Jesus has begun asking his disciples, who are the people saying that I am? You all are out talking with folks, and as you're out talking with them, who are they saying that I am? And they said, well, there are some that said that you're John the Baptist that's come back and you are speaking. Some say you're Elijah that has come back and you're preaching. Others say you're Jeremiah or you're one of the old prophets. They all had a different view of who this one was that had come and began this ministry. But then Jesus narrowed it down and he said, but whom say ye that I am? I'm not really concerned with all of those folk. I want to know who you believe I am. You that I have called. You that are following me. You that are with me every day. Who do you say that I am? And then Simon spoke up as <laughs> always being the first usually to speak. And Simon answered and said, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. Now what Jesus said after that is very important. Because Jesus let him know right there, he said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father in heaven. Now what was he saying? He said, It's impossible for you to come to the conclusion or to come within your own reasoning or your own thinking or within somebody else trying to lead you to understand who God is. It's totally impossible to know that unless God himself reveals it to you. You can never really see God for who he is, nor see Jesus for who he is until God, the Holy Spirit, reveals him yes, to you. Yes. And that's why trying to get people to Christ through these programs and methods of the world and learning how to soul win through some kind of formula is an absolute waste of time because no one can show anyone else who Christ is until the Holy Ghost yes. opens their understanding and they see Him. And that's what He was telling them here. He said you're blessed because you didn't learn this from flesh and blood. There's nothing about humanity that will bring you to the place where you understand God or know who He is. We know that from the book of Romans. He, all through there He shows us clearly that man is totally depraved. He's in such a condition that he cannot even know he needs God or is lost until God opens his understanding to it. So he's saying, Simon, this is God that has opened your eyes and showed you who I am. Now he's going to go on and tell him something else here. Because now he wants to say to Peter, he said, Thou art Peter. Now look at these two words here because it's very important. And if you don't understand the two Greek words, you'll miss the meaning of this passage. He said, Thou art Peter, which is the word Petros. Petros. Which means a stone. Just a stone. A small stone. And he's doing this to show him, show Peter exactly the difference between him and Christ. He said, Peter, you are Petros. You are a small rock. He may have picked it up and showed it. But then he says, upon this rock, Pet Petra, Petra, not Petros, Petra, a hot, large expanse of rock, a great bedrock, a, a huge expanse of rock. Upon this, I will build my church. Now, I know the Roman Catholic Church says Peter 
is the head of the church, and they uh, use him as being the first pope, and, and the church is built upon him. But this scripture clearly doesn't say that if you look at it in the original word, because he said, Peter, you're just a small stone. But it's on this huge rock. And Christ used himself to illustrate that. Uh, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now we know that Jesus is the foundation of the church and his teaching and the apostles' doctrine. But it's on Christ. And that's why when we sing the song on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. He is the bedrock. He is the solid rock. He is the huge rock that the church is built on. So he said, upon this rock, I will build. Now, that's the promise that the church is going to come into existence. The prophecy concerning the church, I will build. Well, I have built, but I will build from this point. I will Man is not man's church. It's his church. The church belongs to Jesus. In Acts 28, he said he purchased it with his own blood. He purchased the church. He bought it. He paid for it with his own blood. So he said, I, shall, I will build my church. Now look at what else he said. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's he saying? There is no power in the universe, in the demonic kingdom, in all of hell, what he's talking about, that can stop the church. Amen. That's what he's saying. No power that can stop God's church. And all of the forces of evil that come against it, all of the powers that be, none of them are going to be able to stop God's church from being built and from continuing on until He comes. That's why it's foolish for us to somehow make statements that, oh, the world's strong the church. Oh, I don't know how we're going to make it. Oh, the world's getting so dark. I don't know how the church going to survive in this dark society. Nothing can stop the church because it's God's church and He's in control of that. And what He's saying is that there's no power on earth as strong as the church. No power. And the reason that uh, society is not completely taken over by evil today is because the church is here. And once the church leaves, you'll see Satan take full control of this world. The church, the power that's in the church is in the world today that is salt and light. Now look at verse 19. Because he says, and I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, he's speaking to Peter, and he's also speaking to the apostles. And we know what keys are. Our keys open doors. And he said, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. These keys will be what will open the door where this church can get going and where the people can come in the kingdom, I'm going to give you the keys. And he gave us, gave them the gospel. And we know that on the day of Pentecost, Peter used the key. And he preached a great message that opened the door for those to come in. And there were all that great number saved that first day. And then we see Peter when he went down to the Gentiles and opened the door to Cornelius. And he came in and was saved. And the key is continuing to be used today through all of us in the church to carry the gospel around the world and to open the door through the gospel for those that will come to Christ. But look at what else he said. He said, And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth 
shalt be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now the church and through the keys of the church we are able to open the door and invite those in that will come and we're also able to close the door and keep those out that are not real, genuine believers. That's what he's saying. And what he's saying is if you bind it here, then heaven will bind it as well. And he was telling them that when you preach the gospel, when you use these keys, when you open the door, you're inviting people to come through Jesus Christ. Those that do not come through Jesus Christ, you have the right to say, no, you don't get in this church, and you are not a part of this church. And he says, when you do that, heaven will agree with you. Here's what he's saying. He's saying the Supreme Court of Heaven will affirm the lower court's decision. That's what he's saying. When we, as the church, we tell this person, no, you can't be a part of God's church because you're not willing to come through Jesus Christ. Yes. You're not willing to bow before Him. You're not willing to uh, uh, confess that you're a sinner. No, you can't get into God's church. And God is saying, I will affirm that. Amen. And I will say in heaven that they're not in, nor can they come in. Because he said, I'm using the church to bring in those that are true believers and keep out those who are not true believers. So there's the promise, the, the prophecy concerning the church. And we understand that it belongs to God. Now, I want us to look at the power of the church. When we look over in Luke chapter 24, look at what Jesus told them before he left. Luke chapter 24. Now Luke, the writer of Acts, just continues the message that he is writing in Luke on over in Acts because he, he's the writer of Acts as well. And look at verse 49 and see what he said before he ascends. He says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But this is what's important. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Don't you leave here until you receive the power. Because you may go out and try to do something for me, but unless you have the power, you'll not be able to do anything because it's the power in you that's going to enable you to do the work of the church. And he said, you stay here. You stay here until you receive the power. Now when you look on over in Acts, turn over to Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 8. And here again, he's telling them the same thing. Here he said, but ye shall receive power. Now he says, you carry here until you receive the power. Now he's getting ready to leave. And he said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. He said, when the Holy Ghost comes, then you will have the power, and then you will be a witness unto me. No one can ever be a witness for Christ that doesn't have the Holy Spirit. No one can do anything that would honor God or that would help anyone be pointed to God without the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's the Holy Spirit in us that empowers us to do His work. And it's the Holy Spirit that operated in the church that makes the church what it is today and causes the church to be that great power that no force on earth or hell or anywhere else is able to overcome. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. And God works through the church. And this is very important that we learn that. God only works through His church. Yes. He doesn't work through long rangers running out here 
on their own, claiming to do something for God. God doesn't work like that. God works through His church. Everything that He does must be associated with a local church because God doesn't create no parachurch things. Every parachurch organization, let me insert this because it's very important because today we have all kinds of parachurch things. They're religious groups not associated with a local church claiming they're doing stuff for God. They didn't get that from the Bible, nor does God use that. Parachurch organizations, let me tell you what they are. They are a fungus. They are a fungus, a parasite that feeds off of the live church. They get everything they get from the church. They contribute nothing to the church because the fungus never contributes anything. It only sucks from it. Every parachurch organization sucks from the church. Funds and things that the church could use to go and do a work for God, they, the parachurch group suck that away and they take it and they feed off of it and they contribute nothing to the church. They could not exist without the church, but the church does not need anything they got. They only take from the church and not help the church. So you tell them that if you yes. see them as I said that. Amen. I don't care what group it is. Promise keepers, all that nonsense. That's all parachurch that just sucks from the church. The local church, everything that is done in this world, that is done to reach people with the gospel, is to be done through a local church. Amen. And there are no such thing as missionaries not attached to a local church. They're long range. Don't support them. I would never support a missionary that's out there claiming to be a missionary if he is not in directly attached to a local church and he's working through that local church to go out and spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's always that way. God never works outside his church. Amen. He built his church and everything that's done is done through that. So the power of the church comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, let's see. What else we might see here? Now, I guess we could look at the program. Well, we know the power came. I never did get to the point where the power came. <laughs> but in Acts 2, we know the power came. And the Holy Spirit came. Because on the day of Pentecost, there came that sound and that from heaven and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That was the power God has sent back now to empower this church in this world to operate in the world until He comes. Now let's go and look at the program. God's program for the church. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 28. Because here, Matthew probably gives us the best, best Commission. Mark also tells us that we're going to go all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And here in Matthew, if you look at chapter 28 and verse 18, this is what Jesus commissioned the church to do after he left. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, that's authority, that word for power is authority. He has all the authority, whether it's in heaven or in earth, it's in him. Go ye. Now, he's, he's commissioning the disciples, and this will carry on down. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all these things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is the commission given to the church. Now what is this commission? We are to bring honor and glory to God 
by our activity allowing him in us to do his work here in this world but it's Christ doing it not us now let me insert these six things right quick of what the church is not to do the church is not to save the world he never told the church to save the world now you may hear that from some folks and they may put a guilt trip on you if you're not out just, just uh, running yourself to death trying to talk people into getting some kind of false profession you know they might, they might get you to believe in that no it's not our job to save the world he never did tell us that nor did he ever indicate that the world's going to be saved there's only going to be a small group that's really born again and go to heaven so the world's not coming to Christ. Another thing, we're not to serve the world. And that's something the church needs to learn because we have got so caught up in trying to serve the world that we get involved in everything going. Every political thing that's going, every everything that's going, that this well, we'll protest this. We'll get out and we'll do this. We'll 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 get involved in trying to make this better. We'll we'll organize and come together and try to have a, a better city and, and we'll do this. No, no, no. We're not to serve the world. And all that is is serving the world and the world's political system and the system or, or this world's system. That's not God. The church is totally separate from this world. So we're not to serve the world. Third thing, we're not to rule the world. And this is a big thing. We have people all the time that if they had the opportunity, they would rule the world. Christians, I mean Christians. And you can hear the way they talk, and the way they go. Can you imagine? I'm going to throw out something here, and I'll make some people mad if they hear this. But can you imagine the world being ruled by the independent fundamental values? Can, can you even imagine that? Lord, have mercy. You think it's bad on the Roman, when the Roman church is in power. I mean, my goodness, can you imagine that? Being in rule and having the authority to make laws and to and and to convict folk and, and to use the power to to my 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 can you imagine that? That's why God said, no, we're not to rule the world. We're not to be involved in that kind of thing. We will be a part of that when Jesus comes, when He's on the throne, when He's King, then He'll be in control here and, and we'll not get out of control but Amen. we're not to be yes. rulers of the world yes. we see what has happened when the church has been in that kind of power they've always abused it they've always abused people they've always abused that power when they had the authority or when they were put in that position they were always abused but we're not to rule the Another thing, we're not to fight the world. The church isn't here to fight the world. Amen. We see that, don't we? Oh, let's get the guys fight this. They're trying to put liquor in our town. We're going to fight. When we get out and fight these folks, we're going to fight them. They, they, they're trying to do this. So they, they try, oh, let's fight sin. God never told us to fight sin. Never told us to fight the world. He told us carry the gospel around the world the fight wouldn't it be something we go into some of these countries that are have so much it, I don't know you can find one that, that would be worse than us but uh, you know what for the evil if you look at the back I mean we destroyed most of the world by our ungodliness it's not the other way around and uh, but trying to go into a place and and uh, somehow fight against them because of their activity or, or what they're doing. I like to think of the time that Moses put the serpent on the pole. Yes. And he said, All you have to do is look at the serpent and you'll live if you've been bitten. 
Now, to be bitten by one of those serpents was to die because when you got bit, you were going to die. Nothing could keep you from dying but looking at the pole. Now, if that would have been us, we would have said we've got to organize a snake exterminating party. And we got to start killing snakes. Because if we don't start killing snakes, then everybody's going to be infected and die. No, you can't kill sin. Amen. Nor can you fight sin and somehow stop sin or stamp it out. You can't do that. What we do is lead people to look at the Pope. Yes. Look at the cross. And show them the cross. Because it's the cross that's going to set them free. We don't fight the world. We don't imitate the world. A lot of folks have now become the imitators. We say, well, we, we need to get like the world so we can draw in the world. And if we'll be like them, then they'll be more uh, out to come. And if we'll give them what they like, then we can attract them. See, that's the very opposite of what the church is supposed to be. We're not supposed to be imitators of the world, nor are we supposed to be like the world. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. And when people see us, they're supposed to see a whole different thing than the world. My Lord, they've got enough worldliness out there. They don't need to put in the church. It ain't never satisfied them out there. Why do you think it's satisfying we brought them in the church? They need something different from that. And then we're not to isolate ourselves this is important. And that means we're not to get our group and hide out somewhere where we won't be around the world. We're to operate right in the world and show them Christ. Now, what is that? That means that we bring honor and glory to God. We make disciples of all nations. Now, I want to talk just a minute about the mission and this program of the church and how God intended us to carry out His ministry. And we know He told us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Now let's understand what that means. We go into all the world with the gospel. When people respond to the gospel, <coughs> and we baptize them into the church, then we are to teach them. You see, don't, don't stop with uh, don't, don't, don't stop with verse 19. You've got to look at verse 22. Now look at what he's saying here. You, when they respond to the gospel and you baptize them in the church, then you begin to teach them and train them all of the ways of God and mature them to where they can grow up to be mature Christians and go out and do the same thing that you have done. So when we talk about mission work, what is biblical missions? What is biblical missions? And how are people to go out? And what is the purpose of them going out to missions? Well, we get everything from the scriptures and the Bible precedent is found in Acts chapter 12 or 13, Acts chapter 13. Turn over there. <clears throat> when, uh, when we look at the early church and how now they are going to start sending mission there is that. And you find the first one sent out in chapter 13 and they are sent from the local church. Now let's read verse 1. Now there were in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manion which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now what he's showing us there in that first verse is there were all different peoples in the church in the place of leadership. All different peoples. Wouldn't like it is today but we're segregated. You know and we've got black folk and black folk and brown folk and and uh, Hispanic and, 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 and uh, Chinese and, and they all their little groups. No, not, not the early church. They were all together and all in the place of leadership. All these people from different backgrounds and different areas. 
And verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, now understand this, the Holy Ghost telling the church what to do. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now understand this, God called them to this work personally. But he also told the church that he had called them to this work and the church now will sanction what God has called them to do and they will go out from the local church not run off from the local church and just be on their own say I don't care what the church wants I'm going out and do this the Holy said the Holy Ghost has now spoken not only to Saul and Barnabas but to the church leaders as well Look at verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed, they're seeking clear direction from God, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They laid their hands on them to give them the approval of the church and to release them to that work from the church. And they go out from the church. And when they come back and, and give reports, they come back to the church and they bring reports back to the church of what they've been doing. So what is he saying here? He's telling us and he's setting a precedent here about missions. When missionaries go out, they go out from a church. God never does anything apart from the church. And I've already said that. God never uses missionaries apart from a church. God never does any kind of work apart from a church. Now what did these missionaries do when they went out to these areas? They went out and they planted churches. Mission work is planting churches. That's why he said when you baptize them, then you teach them. You don't just go off somewhere and have a, have a service and win people to Christ and then leave. You set up a church so you can teach them the ways of God. God never did intend for anybody to go out and preach and get people saved without planting a church so we could train those that have been yes. saved so they could grow up and become strong Christians. So this thing of just running all over the country trying to reach souls and not planting churches is not biblical. Amen. Churches must be planted in the fields that we're working because we have to have the church to train those that we reach for Christ. I would never support a missionary that's not going out to plant churches. Or that's going to be a supporter of a church planter. That means that there are people that go with a church planter to help him. But every mission work needs to revolve around church planting. Paul and Barnabas and then later Paul and Silas when they went out. They planted churches. And they set pastors and deacons and elders in those churches and then they come back to Antioch and they gave a report about the work they had been involved in. They were accountable to the church at Antioch. Amen. No missionary is not, a, that's not a, a missionary that's not accountable to the local church shouldn't be on the field. Amen. He should never give him a dime. He should be accountable to the local church. Everything he does should be reported to the church every day. Reported to the church, every penny he gets should be reported to the church. He should be accountable and he should keep up and be responsible for that because that's godly mission work. Amen. The local church has to be, has to be, has to be the head and the place that missionaries go out from, and church planting is what mission work is. You'll never find in the scriptures where missionaries went out and did, did the nonsense that people do in the day and claim it's mission work. You'll never find that in the Bible. Mission work ain't opening recreation centers. Mission work ain't opening camps. Mission work is setting up churches. 
winning souls, establishing churches, planting churches, and teaching those who have come to Christ how to grow in grace. Amen. What good are you going to do to run off out here and do something that they can get from the Word? Anybody can start a ball camp. Anybody can start a camp where you ride mules and horses. Anybody can do it. You don't need to do that for the church. My Lord, anybody can do that. What the church has done is forget about what God lay in. We brought in everything. And when missionaries go out, they better be going out for one thing, and that's to win souls and to grow them up to be strong Christians. Yes. And if they're not doing that, don't give them a dime. Yes. Stay away from them. Don't support them. There are more bums on the mission field than I've ever seen. That's why I say if you know a real missionary, we might give him a dime. But I ain't supporting bonds. There's a lot of them, all they do is living off everybody, and they wouldn't work in the pie factory, but they want to travel all over the world on somebody else's money. Ain't done a dime of mission work since they've been gone, but that's what they do. Missionaries. There's some good ones. But you have to look hard and long to find them. I remember uh, one of the men that grew up with me. We were all both young and started ministry. He decided he'd go to the mission field. He went through seminary and come back and went to the mission field. I was pastoring the church in Rockwood at that time. One of the men in the church there, and we talked about missionaries. And we talked about him, and he knew him because he'd lived there too. He knew him all his life and his family. And he said, Well, I wouldn't give him a dime so he never would work when he's home. <laughs> so he never would work in the pie factory. And now he's going to the mission field so somebody take care of him so he won't have to work there. And that's what you have. And if you look at what missionaries do on the field, what they do? Sit around. If they're not planting churches and starting churches, stay away from them. Don't give them nothing. Because biblical missions is going out, sharing the gospel, reaching them, setting up a church, and teaching them there after they're saved. Preacher, you're hard. Well, somebody needs to be hard. We got enough bums living off the church. That's why Paul wrote such harsh words to those that would come through claiming to be preachers and prophets. He said when they come through, he was talking about those that come in and say, yeah, we're missionaries or we're preachers and, and wanting the church to support them. And he said, you tell that bunch if they don't get a job and go to work that you're not feeding them. That's what he said. They don't eat. They don't eat here. That's one thing to help a person that's just a low-down drunk or a, a dope fiend. You know, if I saw a drunk out on the street and he said, could you give me some money? I, I'm just a worthless drunk. I'd probably give him some. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a worthless drunk. I, I don't work. Don't aim to work. Just trying to make it. But there ain't anything worse than a spiritual bum. I mean, a person that uses God to live and claim he's in the work of the Lord and all he's doing going from here to there bumming trying to get what he can so he can traipse all over the country and not have to work and claim he's doing mission work no, no, no when Paul and Barnabas went to the mission field they came back with a report and all the things they had done during that yes, time. Yes. When Paul and Silas went back again to go around the churches and check on them and start other churches, they came back with a report of what they were doing and all that they had been involved in. And then Paul went on a third missionary journey. But here's what we better understand. Everything that God does, and this is a big thing, He does it through the local church. Yes, yes. And if it's not a part of the local church, if 
somebody's got something going out here and it's not a part of a local church that is sanctioned by that church and the church is the overseer of it and they're working from that church, you leave it alone because it's not God. God never does work apart from the church. That's why it's so important that we understand that every believer is to be a part of the local church. You see, the Bible, there's nothing in the Bible to indicate at all that there are saved people that are not a part of the church, that, uh, a local church. There, there's no word in the Bible. You can ever find anything like that. Because believers, to be a believer means to become a part of the local assembly and unite together and worship with the other believers. So these folks running around out there saying they've been saved, they've been to church 30 years. Mark them off. All believers are a part of a local church and they will be actively involved in a local church. Yes. Now, I know because I have lived a long time. 63 years. And during my 63 years, I have strayed sometimes away from God. But there's one thing I could never get away from. And that's the fact that I needed to be in church. Yeah. And I couldn't be out of church but a week or two. Man, it was tiring me up. I've got to be in church. That's where I need to be. I must be there. That's where my life is. That's where, that's where I function at. I've got to be in church. So these folks that sit at home never go to church. No, 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 no. There is absolute no biblical precedent that says you're born again if you don't be a part of it. But what do we learn today? We learn that it's God's church, it's the Lord's one that said He'll be with it. The power comes from the Holy Spirit, not from us. The program is the program that the Lord set up, not ours. And everything points back to that local church and must be part of the local church. And everything that we do is to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Because the greatest thing on earth today is His church. Yes. And when He comes, He's coming for His bride, which is the church. And it's the church that He's taken home. And it's the church that yes. he's going into the wedding supper with. It's the church. And I thank God for the church. I don't ever want to be anywhere I couldn't be involved in the church. So let's stand for prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have given us this time. You have brought us here. You have opened up the word to us. And Lord, I pray that we would, maybe if we haven't in the future, in the past, maybe now we would have a different view of what the church is. And really understand how important the church is in this world. And how much we must be identified. Oh, you do not bless folks apart from the church. You bless them through the church. And now, Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church here to keep our burden for missions and be ready and waiting and willing to go when you ask us or when you open the door. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to press on us the need and our burden would get stronger and we would allow you to work through us and just sit back and watch what you will do. We give you praise.